right. Hey, welcome to Sudden Movements. <laughs> Five years later. Hey, it's only two months and two years. I, I'm saying that backwards. Two years and two months? Two years and t four months. I don't know. June of 2020. What a wild time to start a podcast. God, that was really two years ago. That was over two years ago. Doesn't it? It feels uh, like it was 300 years ago. Yeah. I love the idea of a podcast called Sudden Movements where you put out an episode every two years. Yeah. You truly created something new. <laughs> something, something that hadn't been done. A I podcast do that. that lasts over your lifetime and there's four episodes. And there's four episodes. God, that's so smart. There's definitely people who have put out, there's many two episode podcasts on the internet. But the fact that you're coming back, you're busting back in the door at two years and four months. Yeah. I love it. This feels like a bookend, though. Right now, this moment feels like such a bookend to me of of 2020, of early 2020, like early lockdown. Mm. So many things that began. I mean, how much has your life changed? I don't know why I decided to take those two down, really. Well, I think I was... I think I was embarrassed by the like the, it's that aw the awareness thing. You start to become like, or like the awakening thing. Like you are in a blissful moment, and then you're like, "Oh, I'm going to talk about this stuff." And then a year later, you're like, "Oh, that's cringy." Because like where I am now, it feels like I'm in a whole different energy. So like that needs to be wiped away. Yeah. Uh, did you listen to them before you took them down? No. No. You can't. You can never go back and listen. You can never go back and listen because you'll definitely delete all of it. But I think it was real and it was genuine. Are you going to put them back up when you put this up so people know? This is the big three. Or, ooh, you put up a podcast, you leave it for a year, and then you take it down, and then you put up another podcast like Kanye does with his Instagram. Oh, you just like wipe the clean slate? Yeah. Kanye and Michael Che do that with their Instagram. They just, it's just a post. And then it'll be like three posts and then it's no posts. <coughs> I'm going to try not to cough through your hole. Do you think that's why they, it's the same thing? They're just kind of embarrassed them. about what they posted. So they just want to no. wipe it clean. I think they're, be well, Kanye might be, but they're, they're, um, Michael Che is doing it to be funny. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So, uh, well, what were the first two about? Okay, so welcome to Sudden Movements. This is another episode <laughs> two years later. Very sudden.
I don't remember, remember. I mean, the first one was me trying to articulate what was going on at the time and my frustration with being uh, seen as something that I wasn't. And that involved, like, most of the people around me, really. But then it was also the, like, image of the band, me being in the band and that image that, like, kind of perpetuated. But I was, like inwardly like changing so much and trying to like speak my truth but I couldn't speak it to anybody because I always felt like ridiculed or not necessarily ridiculed but like nobody was really hearing me let's rewind so this is what you were explaining on the podcast but let's go all the way back let's go back to what led to that moment what was being in a successful band like for you really what was it really like for you as a person? Oh, man, how much time you got? <laughs> um, it's really complicated because the first three years was amazing. I think what, every, what everybody thinks of as like success and like riding this ladder to like some kind of little bit of fame or popularity is that it's like really sought after and really great feeling and it is, it's fun. And so that, that is true. Um, like pretty immediately that feels really great. So like the first three years was, you know, like the, it, it happened really quickly in the beginning. So there was like a lot of hype. I, we had been, you know, me and Mark had been doing music for a long time in LA before that popped. I had like six years under my belt. He had seven years. And this popped so quick that there was like kind of trying to tame the dragon as it happened. So it was like exciting, but then there was also like we had almost gotten there so many times and then it like fell apart. And so there was like a little bit of a a rush to kind of like make sure we had our shit together, say yes to everything and just keep going. And so it was like a whirlwind for like a year, year and a half where it was like just trying to play catch up. And then it kind of hit. I think I was telling you the other day where I was like, when we played Lollapalooza for the first time and there were like 30,000 people at our stage in the afternoon, which usually is like main stage, you get that many people, but and that was kind of one of those moments where I was like, oh, shit, this is real this time. Um, same thing when we played Australia for the first time. It was like just because we blew up there first. So You weren't prepared for what was happening. You didn't have not time. Really. Like we kind of were. We knew it was like happening, but we were just focused on working hard to make sure we could catch it and make it go. Because like I had had many moments of like, oh, shit, this is it with my other band. And then it like falling apart or like promises being made from the industry and then them like balking. So yeah, it, it definitely, it was like, we were kind of aware, but just focused on keeping our head down. And so once it finally did hit, it was, it was great. Like first three years was awesome. But then it started to become more anxiety ridden and like a little, I was a little fearful of things. And I don't really know how to articulate why I was afraid. Like I, in my brain, I, my like mind, I would say it's like, cause I was afraid to be, to not have anonymity or to be, um, have a lot of people pointing their perception at me thinking I'm one way when I'm really not that. And I think some of that came from being popular before in my life, like in middle school, I was popular. And then I like hurt it, people got hurt by that is like a complicated thing. But I, I basically like popularity just does, it, it means that then there are other people that aren't popular. And so there's like this weird I had some friends that I didn't give enough attention to and they got hurt by that. And I didn't I didn't realize that that was happening. And so then I, in high school, I like actively tried to make myself not popular. Mm. So I like rode that wave a couple of times and I knew sometimes that the detriment to being, having a lot of eyes on you and being popular, that there was like something that didn't feel good to that. Or it's maybe the thing where it doesn't feel like you deserve it because you know you, there's some like darker parts of you or some parts of you that like people wouldn't like and you're hiding those. 
Um, is it like when people are like, oh my God, you're so great, but you can just sense that they don't know you and that whoever they're talking about isn't who you are? Yeah. Because it's so quick. You can feel the fakeness of it. Like people wanting to be a part of something big or something that's popular and them like just running to like a worship position so fast. Yeah. That, like I said in the beginning, it, that feels good because people like you and they like your art. But there's something that's like shaky about it that I'm like, oh, the, uh, like, are they going to still like me if if I I tell them my shit stinks too? Or like that I have problems as well? Like, yeah. oh, are they going to still like me? And um, part of me wasn't afraid of that. Like I, I was comfortable with kind of like just being honest but i also was pretty socially awkward and shy in some ways so like the pressure of of being in, in on pre press was the biggest thing where like people are asking you questions that then sometimes i didn't know how to answer because it was like a group it wasn't just a question about me so it was like give the right answer or not and then i would be embarrassed when i give the wrong answer and get corrected by a member in the band or it was like you shouldn't say that on a magazine or so that became really difficult and that was most of where the anxiety came from just being a musician and playing music on stage i fucking loved that that was always like super fun because of the energy and the like ability to have a huge audience and and do something that i loved so all of that was really great there's so many good parts of it but there were things that freaked you out. Were you always a private person? Because when I met you, you were a very private person, which is unfortunate <laughs> for you that you met me. But um, the story about people coming to your dad's house? Yeah, I guess I was private once I started to figure out that I didn't, I didn't know if I liked the attention. Mm. I became overly, like annoyingly private to where like my my mom still today is like sensitive about sharing things that I like share with her to her friends or her colleagues and stuff when it's not really that way anymore but no there was a weird time where I had f fans that they just they get into that like worship place and then they start to just not realize that they're overstepping people's private matters so somehow there were kids I think my dad might have like used the clout and like given them pictures or allowed neighbors to come in. Like we had these kids that lived down the street that weren't there when I lived there, but um, my dad and mom like became friends with that family. And so then the kids, I don't know if they babysat one time or there was something that the kids like came over. They, I think they liked my parents' dog is what it was. And they dog sit it a couple of times. So, the kids obviously came into the house and I feel like my dad just like let them take pictures of it because he was like, yeah, that's my son and just being proud, but also wanting attention from it. So it's like maybe my dad's fault, but <laughs> no, that felt weird because it was like all of a sudden there were pictures from inside the home I grew up Ooh. of pictures of me as a kid that was like not something I was trying to share. So obviously that feels like gross. And, you know, like, what are they all, what else are they going to dig up? And it's not like I had a lot of stuff that I was going to be embarrassed about, but it just felt like it was an overstep. So that, but that's just like comes with fame and popularity. People are going to do that. But I think that's what I didn't like is that the, it felt like it was an unwarranted, like, I was put on a pedestal and people were worshiping us that it just it didn't feel like it was just about the music it felt like it was something else and i was like put into this god position where like i didn't necessarily want that you know it, like it's weird to say because most people like that attention but well i think that people think they like it but it is it is such a weird aspect of our culture where this person provides a service like art is a service i guess if you want to boil it down to capitalism but it's the only industry where you're then, and I think some people dig this, but like it's the only industry where they own you or something like they have the right to your entire life where it's like you don't get that with your doctor or, you know, with the guy who fixes your car. You're not then you don't get to be privy to the details of their divorce or, you know, 
the when their baby was born or sneaking pictures of their wedding or whatever. So it is a, it is a weird part of our culture where we say, well, I worship you, which you didn't ask for. You just put out art and I like it. And now I have I have created an, a fantasy version of you and I am going to uh, break into your family home and take pictures and post them on the Internet. You know, it's such a it's a weird it's like a drunken, weird thing to me. You know, when it happens, it feels like this person's going to kill me at some point. <laughs> so it's like if you think I'm that cool, uh, you might murder me. Yeah, and I think that there's, like, because when I really look at, it's not that I was uncomfortable that they were going to find something about myself that I didn't want to share, because I didn't, like I said, I didn't have much to hide. But maybe what it boils down to is, like, I think I real I didn't really understand myself and love myself enough that when there were people coming at you that hard and wanting to come into your house and take photos or dig up all the photos online and then be like, I, I love this boy so much and like, blah, blah, and just, you know, drool over you. It was like, I don't, I can't even do that to myself. Why are you doing that to me? Yeah. It's all subconscious. I'm not, I didn't, you know, have the awareness or the words to like put that into a thought until recently. But that's the like subtle part of me that was shutting down and wanting to protect my anonymity in like every way I could. Yeah. And so like, hiding my address and hi- and having like we we had um what do you call it? I mean it was like alter names when we go to a hotel we wouldn't you know check into the hotel under Mark Pontius my name was Dallas Winston <laughs> <laughs> from uh the outsiders i just picked that one fucking isom so isom isom was frodo baggins <laughs> <laughs> uh Anybody who knew Isom would know that they could, if Frodo Baggins on this, be like, oh, that's Isom. <laughs> the big Lord of the Rings fan. But, you know, we did those things. That that was like kind of a protocol when we were going overseas because there were fans that were just more ravenous then. And so they would go, they would find out the hotel. Sometimes these promoters would actually like release the hotel where we were staying because it, mm. pro- it, it added like the hype. And so when they would have a bunch of fans show up at the hotel, added hype to the show. Because then people were like, why are all these people here? What are they doing? Like, oh, we're, there's a festival. This band's staying here. And so they just promote it. So it was like, a, it was different overseas. And that's why we started doing that because it was like an actual security thing. But we, you know, we all loved that, using that moving forward because it was just an easier way to have some privacy mm. when you're on the road. So it's like all those things that like, you some of them are security like it's protocol once you get to like a certain level you have to do that to operate freely and actually like be able to move about the cabin around the hotel go out to dinner and not be bombarded uh you had to do those things and again that all just started to like put us into a different paradigm of reality that was it's just uncomfortable in a certain way that felt like this like private club we were like putting ourselves into and that that in itself if you're not like careful your ego starts to like take a hold of that and be like yeah i am supposed to be anonymous and i'm i'm you know like everybody wants to see me so i have to like put these barriers up and then you you start to become it's just as in this weird paradigm of like the celebrity thing that i i feel like a lot of people egoically like just walk into that thing and and love it and this is a part of me that was always like checking myself and kind of being like why i don't think i want to do this part of it you know um but did, I'd it, be, did it scratch an itch at any point was it fun to yeah be? no and that's what i'm saying it's like i would be lying if i didn't say like i enjoyed that at at times yeah and um but i think i was starting to embark on some some part like my subconscious was like knowing that I needed to search for myself more and that this being like having resistance toward those uh, unhealthy like worshiping towards me wasn't something to play into and that I needed to protect myself the ego part of me that like wanted it yeah so there were, you know, there were like many times like in the beginning, the first three years, it was just sex, drugs, rock and roll. It was like, do the thing, you know, ride the roller coaster. Yeah. Worship me. And I'm cool. And like, 
Um, but there were many times, you know, I felt like when I was in that ego space, I like did some things that were so embarrassing when I look back at them <laughs> and I'll share them with you now. <laughs> Yay. One thing that was like, <laughs> I got made fun of a lot because it just wasn't me. And I was just like it, drunk and in the zone. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> It's just so not me, but it, and it's funny to look at. I, we were in South America and I w I think it was Argentina, maybe a country where like not a lot of English people speaking. We went out to a club and we had security at that time because like I said, it was like early days where we were huge down there. Music tends to like always be bigger in South America. There's just like big fans down there. It's awesome to play down there, but when you're trying to go out and have a good time, you definitely have to have security. And so we went to this like kind of CD club and we're trying to just get into the culture and like have a good time, go dance and party. And we had been to a couple, we had, like gone out to eat, been drinking, gone to a different club. We ended up going to a house party later that night. And, but we got to this club and we were, we went in just like kind of the security got us in really quickly before I knew it. We're like in the center of this, dance party there's people everywhere and there's beautiful women everywhere and they're all you know this foreign like spanish thing that's like super exotic and um i'm pretty shy so like i was never one to go approach a girl first but when you have the cloud of a band it's like you got girls around you that are just kind of like hey but again we were at a club where it wasn't like they knew foster the people was there it was just some dudes, but we do have like security guards around us. So it's like, we're sticking out kind of. Yeah. And so I just assumed like, oh, well, they probably know, you know. <laughs> um, I just remembered what story <laughs> this is. So I started, I was like dancing with this cute girl and she may have approached me first. I'm not sure, but we're dancing and I love to dance. So I'm just like putting the vibes out. And then she asks me, I think, like, who are you? Like, what is this? Very broken English. Like, I don't, I don't know if I understood if she said those words, but she was trying to figure that out. So I, I said, oh, we're just in a band. And then she's like, what? And I was like, a band. And I was like, going like the drum thing, guitar, <laughs> like, <laughs> and, um, then she's like, oh, oh, band, band. And then uh, we're like dancing more and it's loud as hell. So I'm trying to communicate with someone that doesn't speak English and, and broken English at least. And then she's like, what band? And then I was like, foster the people thinking I'm like, boom, there we go. Drop the, the, the golden ticket. I'm in. And she's like, huh? And then I was like, okay, maybe she doesn't understand English. I was like, foster the people. And it was like, and now I'm like screaming, I'm like, foster the people. <laughs> and she's still like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what that is. And now I'm like, okay, well, surely she knows the hit song. Cause that's happened like a couple, I mean, that happens now. You say foster people, they don't know. And then you say pumped up kicks and they're like, oh yeah, I know that. So then I was like, okay, pumped up kicks, <laughs> you know, pumped up kicks. And then she's like, huh? What? And my bandmates are actually like in the vicinity. We're kind of all huddled together. And so one of them hears this going on and starts like watching. And I am like, okay, she still doesn't get it. I'm this far. I'm not going to just give up. I have to, how do I, how do I communicate that and let her know how cool I am? <laughs> so I started singing pumped up kicks. And it's like in her ear, I'm like, you know, like, oh, the other no, kid. Don't, don't, yeah. <laughs> and I can't sing really that well either. And I think it was Mark that heard this. And so he's like oh, dying laughing my at God. me. And she still doesn't under, that has no clue what, who we are. So oh. I just, uh, I'm like, yeah, never, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> you need like a cool ID or something. There should be. <laughs> It was so cringy, man. And so it didn't, nothing, you know, came to fruition with that girl that night. And um, I I didn't know that Mark had seen it. So I was like, okay, sweet. And I don't think anybody, it was too loud in there. Nobody saw that. That's embarrassing. I'm going to keep that to myself forever. <laughs> no one's going to know. 
And I think when we got out, we hung in that club for a little longer. And then we got out and we were going to a house party. And I think we were walking away and Mark <laughs> like came up and was like, dude, I saw that interaction. And then just <laughs> outed me to everybody and told the story. And I was mortified. I was like, and I never lived it down. I the the next seven years that that story got brought up all, all the time so it was that that kind of stuff it was like you know i'm glad that i like went through that little experience but it, it that's sometimes the blindness is just like of being in that paradigm you you as much as i say i don't want the clout and i don't want to surf on that and like to try to get things in life there's a part of you that like you just find yourself in that position sometimes and you you do use it and that all feels like icky to me mm -hmm. because at the end of it it's like i'm really doing it for the love of the music and i hope that the music that i make you know does inspire other people and they like that but as far as like projecting me as like someone that's a genius or a god like it's all really uncomfortable yeah but it's also uh, a part of like being successful is that that that, that happens. And so there is like, they kind of go hand in hand and you have to be able to know yourself deeply and be comfortable with that to like keep the line in between like thinking you are this huge genius and that you deserve all of this attention. Because I think at that point you do actually start to fuck up the connection with your muse of making the art because you start to think that you're better than the the like muse of making the music because I, I mean i believe when you're making art it's a collaboration or like a co-creation between you and the source of creativity of consciousness and so that has to be a very balanced open relationship where you're never over identifying with what it's giving you because then it shuts off. And I think that's what's like a slippery slope within the fame and over like the popularity and celebrityism is that you start to believe your own myth and get in the way of that, that open portal of art. Like why so many people make great things when they're unknown yeah. But then once they're known, it's so hard for them to recreate it. It's because now they are trying to make it from the perspective of I am the thing rather than that kind of open. Yeah, then you're like a conduit. You're like a conduit <clears throat> of the thing. And that does, you know, that is a, it's a hard dance. Like con you continue to get, there's always like something that's getting in the way, whether you're over identifying or thinking you know more or that you you know it's it's such a really weird weird dance but i do think like the ego thing gets in the way so fast um there's oftentimes when i'm making music now where i'm like i get entranced like the best i always know when i'm like in the the zone and have that open connection when i kind of like am out of my body and i don't i'm not aware of what i'm doing per se i'm just like feeling and i'm having emotion that i'm like putting into it and and you go into this like trance and then you kind of at a certain point you get knocked out of it and you kind of then listen back and um, you can still stay in it a little bit. But there, there was like one time where I, something was happening. I was like hypnotized and then I kind of came back into my body and was listening. I was like, damn, dude, how did you just do that? Holy shit. Dude, you're you're fucking talented. <laughs> And then it like closed off and I, I really felt it go like and like the that hypnotized like drug thing I was in like just went out of the room. And then I kind of like got bummed a little bit and like, you know, turned it down, took a break for a second and then listened again. And I was still just like, damn, that's really cool. But I couldn't like create anymore in that little session. And it just is like a really subtle feeling that each individual has their own like um, gauge of when that's working or not, but it's so, it's so sensitive. And I think uh, that I, I just, as I, we were evolving in that band and getting more popular and like going to different countries, having all these different experiences that, that worshipy things started to, um, just feel uncomfortable. And I think that the, the subconscious part of me like knew that I didn't know myself enough and was trying to protect 
this like connection to art, you know? Yeah. Without really knowing that that's what I was doing. So it's like now as a, as a, the awareness I have now, like I'm much more comfortable with it because I feel like I know um, myself enough to, to like be okay with having that attention and not like being afraid of people seeing the, the cracks and crevices of like just being human. Do you think that's the result of taking, I mean, you're what, almost four years into, yeah. Not being in the van? Just being home, not oh, being out, not yeah. really. You can edit that out. Do you think it comes from that? Is that what you're the question? <laughs> you're like, yep, burp. <laughs> no, that's my cracks and crevices. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to fart you in a minute. Pre- Bitch, this is what I just said. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you've been home. You've been home, kind of isolating for four years. Yeah, I mean, I think that's part of the healing for sure. Um, and that was a whole other part. I didn't like at a certain point. I didn't like the job part of it, like where you're just never home, constantly having to rehearse for something, and then there's the pressure of we have, we need to write a new record or there's there's press and video, all the stuff that kind of goes along with, with it. Um, that was one thing right up front. I didn't really like was that you work, you know, as a kid, you're trying to be like, I want to be in a rock and roll band. I want to be a musician. And you're just working on the music and you're focusing on your craft. And then you finally get there and then it becomes like a business right away. You have like massive business decisions to make. When I, for me, I was like, never focused on business and wasn't into the the like way to ladder climb in the business and be smart and knew nothing about it so but I just remember a couple of the first big decisions that we had to make as a group had like a lot of money behind the decisions it was like a yes or no and that meant like a huge monetary um addition or not and things like that that had or like agreements that were six years of an agreement, you know, um, those decisions were like so hard. Cause I was like, I'm just fucking creative. I don't know. I'm just trying to be an artist. Like what is all this other stuff? And it's a super important part of like, if you want to have a long lasting career, you have to be smart with those things. So all that pressure, I really didn't like. And luckily we had good management and good people around us to help us make those decisions. Other people in the band were into the business. So they had like more, um, better instincts, but definitely being home, I had been burnt out for the last like four or five years of the band and having a lot of resistance to going out on the long tours or having to go do the things like play radio shows. Cause there's a lot of like political stuff you have to do to like scratch the back of the industry. So then they promote your record and do all that like handshaking shit. I really didn't like, um, cause I just wanted to make art. And so I was really burnt out. I wanted to just stay home for like ever. And I think that, that again, a subconscious part of me wanted to, needed to do that to heal and figure myself out so I could finally be comfortable and not be like so anxious about it all. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but just some things I know about you. Um, <clears throat> I call you the authenticity police a lot because you are... <clears throat> You are not the funnest to be around (laughs) when whatever the thing is, is not authentic. Do you think that that's part of your struggle? You're someone who really appreciates messy. um, You're, you're someone who really appreciates all, all forms of beauty. You can find beauty in a lot of things as long as it's being honest. Yeah. And you, you have a wide variety of interests as long as they're being honest. But as, so- as soon as something is pretending to be something, uh, yeah, you get pretty pretty grossed out by it pretty fast. Do you think this is what your resistance to the business aspect of art was, is that you weren't being honest, like that it's a lot of bargains, if you will? Yeah, yeah, the business side of it. And then, because a lot of that, like once you get in the door of success and get like a label and get all these things, then the, the primarily like the the best 
one of the only ways to prolong it and keep going is to do the like handshaking thing and smile and do the interviews and do all the stuff that <coughs> is kind of fake. You we're kind of all doing this thing where like we're fixing our hair and like making ourselves look good on the videos and like makeup and all that stuff that just felt like, yeah, this is stupid. Like we're not like showing our true beauty, which is the cracks and the crevices, which again, like I was uncomfortable to share because I just didn't know myself enough, I guess. Um, but I think that's what I kind of hate about celebrity culture in general is that it's all curated. It's all very like stale um, because like everything's trying to kind of homogenize and be the same because like that's kind of what the industry is doing. They're kind of trying to follow the trends of what worked just before and what's cool. Now they're going to make their artists kind of follow that yeah. generally. And that always just felt stupid and like I didn't really enjoy doing that and again not totally understanding that while I was going on but like there was a part of me that was like always bucking against it I definitely became the annoying person in the band the authenticity police but I didn't they wouldn't call it that then I would just call it like a bitter asshole <laughs> I, I just I just always like not wanting to do that because that's not cool or whatever or I don't you just having random reasons I would come up with to try to like intellectualize at the time to, so we couldn't wouldn't do it um, but at the end of the day it was just a lot of it felt like performative and fake to get the thing you know so we could go play the arena eventually where well, you got to like lick the radio uh, the radio company's ass and like do exactly what the label wants you to do because they know how to promote and like climb that ladder of money and, and fame and it's like no let's just make good art and that's like that's how we got here it's like <laughs> me and mark were broken as fuck and being like burned by the industry that we finally were just like both wanting to make music from our heart and just like let it pour out and that's what happened and that's what got us in the door and it's just so hard like we kind of always were trying to like keep ourselves grounded and always like hang on to that and not try to do what the label said and like play into the pressure and just always focus on like that connection to the muse of making good art but it's harder than you think like you, you once the pressure does come and the expectation and then there's like it takes a lot of time to make really good art sometimes you gotta like sit and and get vulnerable and like feel the pain again and once you start getting money and comfort and all the like you have the ability to go on vacation and go spend a lot of money you just start to like lose that real deep connection and um so it, it you know i think we did the best we could but like before we knew it i, I just felt like we were kind of faking faking a lot of stuff and that definitely is like not for me as like a hipster artist, I don't, I don't like calling myself hipster, but I definitely have that tendency to just like do something fresh and new. And then once people are on it, I'm like, okay, go on to the next thing, you know, but, um, I like the authenticity place is a better word for it because it is <laughs> trying to find like the authentic thing. I, I just, yeah, I definitely find more, I'm more attracted to things like that feel like mistakes in music or noisy and like little things that are out of time because there's like expression to it and there's like a real soul there's like a real human thing happening when everything is quantized and perfect and like pristine and really like combed over it starts to get just super boring to me yeah like we were talking about pop music is it like formulaic like and it's so weird because i feel like trends in art are somebody comes and does something unique and their own thing and then that takes off and then the industry any of the entertainment industries go and try to recreate that and then mm -hmm. that's the thing for a while until somebody steps out and does something new but it's tough when you're when you are already the thing when you're already established as a thing it's really hard not to pretend to be that and that 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 doesn't just have to be in in art it can be you know when you've established yourself as a certain showing up a certain way in a relationship 
it's hard not to just continue to play that role. It's hard once something becomes your identity. You know, it's when you're chronically ill, it's hard not to become the chronically ill person. You know, so when you are the established artist, it's hard to stay authentic because now you have this identity that yeah. has taken over that is doing that. So it's a, it's very tricky. So I can't imagine how it was in that. Scenario. I find the the thing that I want to do, which is like what you say a lot is that you, you're when you're doing a podcast and you kind of a, like do it, you've got like a couple episodes under, then you're kind of like, okay, I'm done now. I'd like to change the podcast or change the, the idea or whatever it is. Um, change the scene. That's kind of like what I think. I mean, I really like doing too. And I think that's why I was like focused on the anonymity so much because that was like a way to keep some of the information down and be able to pivot into something else. So I think like, you know, my desire to leave at some point, it was, it was like many reasons why I wanted to leave. But um, in some ways it just felt like it was kind of done. And I now want to go on to something else. And it's not necessarily a different band or like doing a solo project. It, I have many interests, so it just feels like I don't. I, I we're now pigeoned as this, and we can keep making great music. Mark is always going to make beautiful music. He's like so talented at what he does, but this as a band seems to have done its thing and run its course. And um, I'd rather get off when it's like feels good. Uh, than to go kind of get become redone and like washed up in some way. And so you either have to like really reinvent the band and reinvent yourself and pivot and do something wild and be risky. And that, that can feel fresh and new when you go against the grain and prove people that you're something else. And like Radiohead's really great at doing that. But I don't think we were on the same page as a group to really do that successfully. And so then I think I just, yeah, it felt like, okay, I, I would like to change this up and I don't want to keep getting known as this. I'm kind of done. And so figuring that I'm still figuring that out what that is, you know, I've always been into film and art and just expression in a lot of different ways, but I do love music so much. It's truly like a cathartic thing for me. And so, there's other ways to do music and not just be like a solo artist or be in a band. You know, you can make music for film, you can make music for podcasts, which is what I've been doing for you. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, so I'll, I'll do it in some way, but yeah, the, the thing, there's something about like doing it fresh and being, uh, doing it like for the first time and, Everybody loves finding a new first thing. Like the first time we popped as a band, like one of the things that made us so successful is that the song became huge. Public Kicks became huge, but like we barely, we didn't have a website. I built the website out of scratch, like in a rush because the song was blowing up. It got posted on a YouTube, like through a manager, our old manager, like just through word of mouth, somebody like put it on an L magazine thing and it blew up. And we wanted to catch all of that attention. So I just made a website with a couple photos and the name, and that was it. And there weren't even names. And so people came to find it, and there was, like, this new song that everybody wanted to, like, get their whole album and, and see the rest of what the band was. And there was no information. And it was amazing because it generated so much mystery about us that then, like, imploded once we had the record it was like everybody just came to eat it up because there was like that tension and i think so the first time when something like blows up is like the most exciting moment and then you can extend that out by keep making good music and kind of keep the mystery going but once they know everything about you and they kind of know what to expect it just gets like kind of boring to be the in the control seat unless you really like steer it some other crazy direction so that desire to just jump off and then go try to start fresh and new again and get that excitement about, okay, here's a new thing. Nobody knows what it's going to be. I don't even know what it's going to be. It's like so exciting. And I, I don't think everyone's like that, right? Because you and I share this this perspective of once I've done it, that that when you said the band had run its course, it doesn't mean like the the band, those guys are done. 
it just means like you did it. You start, you started it. You rose to the position. You fulfilled all of your dream. You checked all the things off of your bucket list. You toured the world multiple times. You did it. Like for you, that's yeah. the course. Everything after this is me repeating the same course. Yeah. And that I'm not interested in. And something that people don't, most people don't connect to this is it doesn't matter if it's successful. <laughs> the success is in the experience. Yeah. And even if it's successful and this makes me look crazy, I don't want repeated experiences. And I think some people are built for, you know, uh, you know, the people from our hometowns, like marry your high school sweetheart, stay married for the rest of your life, uh, you know, buy a house, buy the second house, have 2.5 kids, you know, join the union, whatever. That's what people in my hometown do. And they have the same friends their entire life. And there's a part of me that thinks, wow, that's really cool. I could never do that, though. It's not who I am as a person. I can't stay doing much for more than, you know, the only way a relationship is going to last me a long time is if I'm with someone who's also really interested in change. And the fact that something is successful isn't motivating enough. For me, it's not novelty, but it really truly feels like things are born, they live a life, they mature, they start to deteriorate. And when they start to deteriorate, exit yeah you know totally and not deteriorate in a negative way i just mean like fully mature right so like a like a plant you know it's like okay this thing has like seasons and that's something that you and i connected over really kind of early on where i think a lot of people are like no if this is successful we will run this into the ground and so, <laughs> you know and not saying that's going to happen in that scenario or that would have happened but you and i share that thing where it just feels like i did it it's not as exciting. And I, I just wonder if that's probably too, you know, the like famous saying of it's not the, the end is not the goal. It's the journey. Ah, uh, 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 yes. The famous so, saying. That, whatever that fucking <laughs> the, famous. The journey. Saying that I just the journey. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's like the famous saying, when you're going to the place and sometimes it's the thing. It's the place on the way. <laughs> Oh, you butchering figures of speech and quotes is my favorite thing. Uh, it's the journey is the destination. Yeah. I don't actually know the. No, that's that was something like that. Um, that's maybe like what it is. I'm just trying to like. That's I, I really align with that, and it is hard to when you do have success and you have there's a lot of money and there's a lot of like attention. It's hard to get off that boat because. You know, you, you could just keep going and you'd be comfortable money wise and all those other things. But like, I just definitely found myself like going on tour and being like, this is, it's like, just again, like all the little things would become really grating. Like the green room hang, that's the hour before the show. Okay. Now the show was always fucking magic. Like that's the hardest thing to walk away. What was the synergy that our band had? No matter the drama, when we got on stage, the synergy it was amazing. It was like spiritual. Everything was like so fun. But all the stuff around that was just like hamster wheel feeling to me where it like it definitely um, felt like purgatory in some sense. And I think that is there's a deep desire of me to just change and have a new experience. Um, but it's hard to get off that, that big one because like culture says you shouldn't. You know, and right. most people don't want to give those things up, but that's an experience in itself is like going, I'm going to put that down and that's going to burn a little bit and it's going to be challenging in life now, but that's an experience in itself. And I kind of knew that too, that I was like, I'm not a lot of people will be doing this, but let's have this experience and I'm going to jump off and not know where I'm going to land. And, uh, it's definitely crazy, but then, you know, yeah, I just love the the same thing when I'm making music. I struggle to finish songs because I love the process of like birthing it out and I don't know where it's going to go. Is this going to be a melancholy song? Is this going to be joyful? Is this going to be like have a beat in it? Is it not? Is it what's it going to do? Is so exciting. And then once I get to the part where I've gotten like a couple different changes and there's like a verse and a chorus and it's got like life to it. 
I, I sometimes I'm kind of like, okay, I'm done, and and I don't really <laughs> you finish. Won't release it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, We're aware. Yeah, it, but that that's because it's like it's just I'm doing it because it's kind of cathartic for right now. I would love to finish those things, but it definitely takes work to do it. And so that's a stagnant place to be as well. You know, it's not necessarily it's it's more fun to definitely birth the things out. They're just private in my hard drive right now, but. Um, yeah, that's definitely a lot of why I was, was leaving and kind of over the thing. It started with like the fame and the real deep shit. Now it's just about authenticity, please. Authenticity. <laughs> so, um, I want to kind of talk about a couple things. Remind me, I want to close this with what, what is success now? But so I can't remember. I think I was on both of the last two episodes. This yeah, might just be our podcast, yeah. and we because <laughs> I can't I can't do it by myself. Yeah, podcasting by yourself is fucking hard. But uh, when I think back, to but it's that, like, why am I podcasting? Really? Because it's there's something about expressing your perspective that is seems like the moment that we are in that feels I don't know. Yeah, I want to think there's ultimately a lot more of like things that I like to thoughts and weird stuff that I like to talk about. I just can't really get to a place where I feel like um, I have the space to share it because I always it just sounds like I'm some authority on it. But it's really about like fun, creative ideas that I think are just fun to talk about. But it's like in a sense, it's like a lot of podcasting is just to get attention, like listen to me talk for a while on a mic when I kind of hate that. But I do desire it at the same time. It's weird. Well, you and I talk about this all the time. What is the, there's something cringy about seeking validation outside of yourself, but there's something, something that, something about having a witness or being seen that feels very fundamental to whatever it is that we are as creator beings, yeah. you know, however you want to look at that. But yeah, I think that there's a as a authenticity police, there's a thin line between observing what other people just observing your own shadowy bullshit and um that of others and becoming kind of a judgmental dick. Yeah. And locking your own ego in the basement so that you can just be eternally cool. <laughs> And that's not wildly authentic. I think that when we are like truly authentic and vulnerable, we have egos. Yeah. And it's just kind of like, yeah, I'll just try to be as self-aware as possible. But, you know, it's you're always going to be more self-aware today than yesterday. Yeah, I think that's like a hard thing I've had to swallow is that the idea of a witness and like you, we are uh... – I felt so alone for so long in the like life I was living with the people around me that I felt weren't seeing me and cause I wanted, I had like a deeper part of me and like things that I was ideas I had about reality and all these deep things that nobody's really interested in. And that made me feel so alone. And all I was trying to do was get somebody to like hear me and see me because that's like, I felt alone. And so like at that, just at that base level, it's like you want somebody to see you. You need a witness, even if it's just like my personality or my weird quirks. Like, please, can you talk deep with me for a minute? Like, I, I just want to try to show you this thing I'm seeing, you know. And that when it comes to art, I'm like so kind of traumatized by that, the whole experience or like just not understanding it that I'm now just like, yeah, I'm just going to make art in my basement forever. And, and I have all these cool ideas that I want to share, but now I'm not going to talk on the mic because I'm too cool and I don't want the attention. So it's like finding the line between like wanting attention for like that you're saying, like seeking validation outside yourself in a negative way or like an egotistical way. But then there is a stepping into your power and going like, this is me. And I, I want to share this because this is fun to share and bounce off somebody else. And have it be you know witnessed and have it be out there it's such a weird like it's hard for me to find that balance i my take on this um wanting external validation is that there's nothing wrong with wanting external validation there's nothing wrong with your ego is that when your ego runs the show 
you can miss a lot of life because your ego is is trying to find something a a satiation that can't be found outside of you. Yeah. But to be an artist or someone who performs on stage and then to try to convince yourself that you don't enjoy accolades, you know, I don't enjoy pedestalization that feels not connected to who I am as a person. So if people compliment you're funny, you know, or you're the way that you're vulnerable helped or, or the way that you talked about things that are embarrassing helped, that's fine. But when when people come with that like crazy pedestalization, I just it literally to me feels like, oh, you're going to hurt me one day. Is this what it feels? It just feels like, oh, I can't live up to that. And so mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm going to have to pay the price when I don't live up to that. It's got to be way worse to be big. Uh, I haven't experienced that, but to have, to have your art be something so much further from who you are. So as a comedian, it's like, I am, especially the kind of comedy I do, I am really letting people see a lot of who I am. So I feel like the pedestalization is, is different because there's, there's less room for people's fantasy, but being on stage or making art is going to excite your ego <clears throat> and I think that our ego is a part of us, but my experience with it, at working with people who it's really low self-worth, I think that really sucks you in to the, the fame goblin, you know, and that is, I don't love myself. Like I'm not creating that love within myself and acceptance within myself. So I need it from other people is not sustainable. Yeah. And so it eats you alive. So I see accolades as an external validation, as a drug, because I think it's lying to say I don't get high on that. I think it's lying to say I don't enjoy that feeling. But like a good drug, it should be done in four to six hours, and then you move on with your life. And when it is sustenance, when it is a food, when you can't make it through a six month lockdown without getting it, without your entire worldview of yourself shattering, then, then there is perhaps an issue if there is an issue only because it's not sustainable because external validation is really hard to sustain for a long period of time because people's that shit's so waning. It's so fading. You know, it's like you, you blow up, but then the odds of keeping that for a really long time are slim the things that people like, they're so fickle, whatever. They love to put people on pedestals and then tear them down. And if that's your whole view of who you are, coming down has got to be fucking awful. Getting ripped down off of that pedestal has got to be terrible. Um, In the last... Uh, shut, shut up, Jessa. In the... No, I love it. <laughs> in the... Uh, I feel like I locked... I go through phases of like that, like trying to convince myself I don't... I don't... It's not fun to have people – for me, it's like live performance, like having people like your art or whatever. I call, it's called locking your ego in the basement where you're just trying to be like above it. I'm just so spiritual. Yeah. I don't have an ego. And then a lot of your drive goes away because the yeah, ego totally. pro- provides a lot of that. So I'm kind of coming out of that right now just so I can take my ego to the stage and then bomb. Um, so what I – what I remember about 2020 is that it was bonkers and that we maybe talked about spiritual awakening in a way (laughs) that was, you know, it was a moment. It was a moment. And, um, I want to talk a little bit about your process. I think we probably talked about it back then, but I love this idea of a podcast where each year you come back and tell the exact same story, but from the new perspective, right? Because, and I've said this earlier on a different podcast we did, right now really feels like a bookend for some reason to like March of 2020, where March of 2020, like when I think back, it feels dreamlike and crazy and unhinged. And it was. And now it just feels like this balanced two feet on the ground Oh, okay, maybe everything wasn't as wild as I thought it was. Oh, maybe this was just about me coming back to myself. And so I like a lot of the stuff that you've said about, because this is not how you were wording it, you know, three years ago when we met, you weren't like, I didn't know myself. 
You know, it was still right. very externalized. It was like, this was wrong and this was wrong. And now you're like, I didn't know myself, so I didn't know how to handle it. Yeah. You know? So I'm curious for you, like, what – I'm curious – I know the story, obviously. But I'm curious for you how you would frame it now. What started to shift for you around, let's say, 2017? I don't know how to time stamp life, so I don't know what was <laughs> like going me. on in 2017. <laughs> Um, and I guess that was kind of like the beginning of the end. Did it start for you? Like what made you start digging into consciousness ideas, spirituality yeah. ideas? I want to really figure out a new way to, to say what we're talking about, which is the unknown, the like unspeakable thing that like a lot of people are experiencing and we fucking call it awake I hate it. And I really hate it. And I, and I, the, especially cause there's like the whole like woke thing now, which was kind of like hijacking, I guess what that was, but it's almost a they different thing. They were two thing. completely separate things okay, that well, have gotten, gotten blended. kind of melded together. Awake used to be what people called, I don't know, it has so many different meanings, but is now I would say it's self-aware, but it can get projected onto conspiracy theories, aliens, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. And it, I just hate the thing that always it makes it like hierarchical. Like I'm awake and you're not. I used to be asleep and I was dumb. Now I'm awake and now I'm smart. <laughs> yeah, I used to be asleep and I was wrong. Now I'm awake and now I'm right. And it like that's not at all what it is. But like when you try to talk about it and you're going through it in the moment, like you have to use those words because there's like nothing else to make sense of it. And in doing it, you sound schizophrenic, which is like part of it. And so the word, I guess, yeah, it's like awareness or like a broader awareness because sometimes it isn't just self-awareness. Like I definitely have like deeper self-awareness now, but it's it's like awareness in general of like the real nuance, the potential like crazy chaos that can happen within like one moment of the day if you like are aware enough and you're watching an ant walk across a leaf and like tune in to just how crazy that is that that kind of thing where like that sounds like a high man talking but like <laughs> when i'm not high like doing that you can i can now like tune into like all the little crazy nuances of that and so i think at, at a, in 2017 there was somewhere around there that like i being really unhappy in the band being searching always for something deeper and never really getting a lot of that exchange with people around me that I started to just do it on my own and spend a lot of time by myself on the road, which was easy because you had a lot of like travel time, a lot of times in hotels and a lot of times waiting around for things. So I started to become a bookworm and, and just like, I don't know what I would, was doing. I was just searching for some answer I had been religious growing up, but like that never, I would like put that all down and just like, that's not the thing. Maybe there's some kind of real truth to that. I like the like m mystical, spiritual, like woo woo thing that kind of was there. But, um, there was just this like insatiable thing. I had to like search and read every book and I kind of like take on a million different ideas. And as I started doing that, I started getting fulfillment, like blissful feelings of like, holy shit. Like I didn't know this and that about my seemingly mundane, like repetitive hamster wheel life, like there's all these other things that are going on and um, starting to discover that like magic might be real. Like there is this other etherical element of spirituality that like you can actually like play with and invoke. And so that's all like consciousness stuff at a base level, but then it can be, you can become, it can become spiritual and paranormal and all that UFO stuff. But I never, I didn't get there for a while. It was like mostly psychology stuff, I, I guess, in the beginning. But <clears throat> I was trying to fill some hole. And so I was unhappy where I was and thought that, that that's what I was trying to solve is how to be happy with what I had, which everybody thought was so good. And like, why was I unhappy with it? Was the beginning of like me trying to fill that void and, and figure that out. And um, I think there were a couple of times where people, like some close friends, could see that I wasn't unhappy 
and isolating myself a lot and suggested I go to therapy or something or get help. And that was like the last thing I wanted to do because I just didn't feel I, I wanted to. There was something that I was like, you need to figure this out yourself. And not that I didn't, I wasn't open to getting help, but I was like, I want to try myself first. I just don't, I'm getting a lot of like fulfillment reading books by myself and intellectualizing and, and going over this by myself. And in doing that, I found my way into like, a couple philosophers that something happened when I got to a certain point of knowledge and information that then made my awareness like really expand and like a big moment and like a singular moment. It was like, like, so I had some kind of blissful experience that showed me that like, okay, there, there's something else in reality that's like very real that I, have been taught that like isn't real because hmm. there was like a feeling and an experience associated with all this like mumbo jumbo talk of spirituality and like god or like some other kind of element and so like that made me like really hook line and sinker to like okay i have to figure out what we're in what is reality what is consciousness what is it to be human and i knew that there wasn't really anybody around me that like was going to share that like they weren't doing the same thing so i just really isolated a lot um as a way to kind of probe more and not be influenced by people saying hey you're losing your mind or hey that's ghosts aren't real you know whatever it was or the other side of it is like i had a lot of christians around me that were going to be like oh that's jesus christ speaking through you i was like no i know it's not that <laughs> um so yeah, that like, it just, it was, I was so curious. Like there was that, when that moment happened, it was like laughter and like fear and, and mystery that was just like, oh my God, this part of reality is like what I'm made for. I think this is why I'm here. Like this shit is so fun. It's like being in some mystery madhouse of reality. Like everything felt very playful. And then like a month later, I was like deeply depressed. So everything went back down to like, okay, this is really real. And I, I, I it's serious and um i oscillated through that up and down you know for like a year year and a half and like went through the gamut of all the typical things carl young and alan watts and terence mckenna and trying to understand all the different angles of spirituality and consciousness and um then just eventually got into psychedelics because that was like a way to experience some of these things and all the meanwhile, I'm trying to fit into like an old life, I guess. I'm trying to fit into the band and keep doing that thing where you're kind of like being fake on screens. And I, I didn't I didn't feel like I was being fake. I was being real. I was being bitter and like didn't want to be there. And you could tell I was quiet and like I did isolated and didn't hang out with people. Um, but I was like in the ship of something that was like, doing that thing, shaking hands, smiling, and going, like, we're trying to get to the top, you know. And then I had friends around me that were, um, a lot of them, turns out, you know, were just kind of being friends with me to be associated with that success and ultimately weren't, like, really seeing me for who I was, though I wasn't very good at showing them that either because I was bitter and just uh, isolated. So all of that, like, was catalyzing the awakening, too, the awareness expansion, not awakening, whatever the <laughs> fuck it is. Cause it truly, it's like, I, I became aware pretty quickly too, that this was happening to other people. I mean, my first feeling was, Oh shit, does everybody know this? And I'm the only one that doesn't know this. That's why I'm unhappy. Like, yeah, everybody knows this. It's just hard to communicate and everybody just keeps it to themselves. Or I thought all the successful people, all celebrity, everybody that's like at the top, this is part of it. Like once you ride this ladder, you get to a point where you're like, Oh, what, what the fuck is this? And then you have enough time and, freedom because you don't have to work daily in a day job that you can like actually read books and figure this out and so everybody knows i don't know and then i figured that wasn't it but I, I could tell then there was like a lot of other people that this was happening to so you definitely go through that first like gate of like oh god i'm jesus am i the new jesus oh shit like i have to tell everybody and awaken the masses and I didn't really stay in that zone very long. I never thought it was Jesus, but I did at one point. I was like, is the whole reality centered around me? Yeah. Because it feels like that. Like, I'm sure a lot of people can equate 
like would the, relate to that. Like the Truman Show. Yes. Or, yeah, or like I'm being pranked or, uh, you know, am I in a coma and everyone is me or... Um, I think because we're raised on so many, this is the loneliness that you can't articulate it when this, until this happens to you. But <clears throat> if you choose to whatever, I, I, it's so hard to talk about it without it sounding hierarchical or yeah. better than. And I think that part of that comes from us in it because it's so lonely that you end up telling yourself a hierarchical story to feel better. Mm -hmm. But when... When it happened to me and mine happened in a near death experience, but I was always a, a seeker, I think is what they call people like us. Like there is a high from seeking deeper. Yeah. And from the time I was a kid, I was like, well, wait, what do you guys think about all day? Like you're not grinding on what is reality, <clears throat> you know? Yeah. Um, there, there is this sensation that, oh, once it clicked, like once I had that experience was like, oh, I just need to tell people because we grew up on these propaganda movies. These like, oh, all, all, all the all the journalist has to do is get to the before the newspaper prints in the morning and prints the story and the bad guys are exposed and everyone realizes. And so we all kind of have this warped idea of like justice and truth. And so when you wake up and you go, holy shit, I can see it. Surely all I have to do is tell people yeah. and they will see it also. And then you tell it to people and you watch them think, oh, man, they've lost it. Yeah. And you go, oh, my God, I look like I've lost it. Espe you know, I look insane. Like I sound insane. And at that point for me, when that started to happen, like a couple people that happened to, I actually was like, oh, shit, this is cool. This is like a challenge. <laughs> This is like, I got to get better. I got to figure out the other way to show them this thing. You know, so then I would like loft myself up a little bit more and be like, okay, I'm the trickster that has to figure out how to like wrap these people in. So many different levels of like egotistical lofting up, which is like now I understand to be the protective mechanism of your, try your ego does not want to let go of that closed reality that it's living in. And it's trying to not die. And so it's always just like one upping you every time. And so you become, become this like spiritual ego that's like even worse. It's like that shit's like crazy dark. But um, yeah, I think I, I just at some point I realized like I needed to kind of keep my mouth shut because every time I try to talk to people, I got looked at funny. And then certain people were really like didn't want me to do that. And were afraid that I needed help and things. So I was like, okay, I, the more I talk, the worse this gets. So once again, I'm going to isolate. And I did have a lot of, like my mom and sister, like fucking were always like, where, yo, you haven't talked to me for like six months. What's going on? And I just wouldn't answer or, you know, and I ghosted a lot of like really good friends I had in LA. And it is it, just really hard. Like I felt like that was all I could do. Um, but I just felt like I needed to keep learning and probing and getting more and more macro to finally understand this so I could be okay and be happy. And then some spiritual ego part of me was like, and then I can tell everybody, you know, <laughs> uh, I mean, like it finally that that went away because the funniest shit now is like now I am in this position where it's like, oh, this is so sick. I know nothing. <laughs> Like, and that's the fucking coolest place to be because you like are so open to ideas where you're like, I know I'm just trying to like, yeah, I'm going to go down the rabbit hole. If this is all simulation for a month and I'm going to like, that's going to be it. And I got, okay. And then that's all going to become really boring. And then there's going to be some other rabbit hole I'm going to go down. That's going to contradict that. And then I'm going to get a new expansion. And then like, and after doing that wave, like so many times I've realized I'm like, oh, this isn't ever ending. You just keep expanding and trying to like figure your inner self out. Like you have to always go inside. You get information outside. I'm obsessed with doing that. But then you do have to like apply it inside and actually go through the practice of like figuring those things out. What's true for you yourself? Because like, again, we're only, you know, there's some wonderfully smart people of books that I've learned so much from and who kind of guided me into this. But you do become aware that they have their own distortions as well. They have their own perspectives that like only their life gave them that blueprint. And then they shared very beautifully. The best ones share very transparently the 
their perspective on reality and if you know how to like pick up what they're putting down which is mostly in poetry and metaphor it's not the words it's like the big picture they're trying to point to then you can apply those things to your life because they're transient they're not like just those person's truths it's kind of a broader truth but a lot of them are not that way like a lot of them if you just like pick up what they're saying and you try to regurgitate it in your life it's like distorted and it actually might not be true to you so you do i had to learn how to like find that inner thing that is my guide to like filter everything through and not just take what this smart philosopher that everybody else reads and says is a genius guru that it might not be true for me so that was always like a, a big thing to trying to weed through all the information and feeling like oh this book got me there i now know everything i got to the end okay but then literally like a week goes by and you're like ah now i'm i'm back down and depressed again or i'm bored or like so i finally getting to that point where it's like oh you, you just, the point is to like not you just know that you don't know kind of thing and that's the like kind of most fun place to be um i feel like I feel like what most people do with like Netflix series, you do with whole belief systems. So you'll binge a person's perspective. You'll hear a guy on a podcast and then you'll binge everything they have. And then you'll just be obsessed with it and like living in that reality for like three weeks. And then you're like, okay, I'm done. And, and moving on to another thing like a hobby. Yeah, it really is a hobby that like, I'm glad I'm with you now because you're the only person that I know ever that could like deal with that kind of like, because as we said before, like you kind of have to have a witness. So I love just like sharing it and barfing it up onto you and then, you know, not necessarily overwhelming you. It kind of is like fun for you to ride that train. And then next week I'm going to like say something else that's going to contradict it all. And you're like, oh, cool. Like this is. But I do think what's happening, I've tried to explain this on your podcast many times, is that once I, I let go of the idea that there's no end and there's no, like, final perspective to, like, get it, but I still find so much value in, like, jumping head in and, like, never looking for, like, a rigid final belief, but looking at them as ideas and perspectives. And, like, I love just taking in all of that when somebody else has, like, really interesting ideas and a lot of information to back it up and facts. And then they also are poetic and they have, like, a lot of metaphor in it. So much fun and, like, just swimming in that for a long time. And uh, instead of looking for the final answer, I now just, like, take that on and then when I get bored or take a break and kind of ground myself again, cause this is all like really heady stuff for me. It's like floating out in the clouds and it's, it's not easy to be around like sometimes. So I then will ground myself and then kind of get interested in something else and follow my intuition, which is literally like, I kind of just Oracle it, like whatever starts to synchronistically show up in life, I start to follow that thread and then it leads me down and I start to feel bliss from it. And I'm like, I get really excited and Oftentimes, like something that a rabbit hole that I was down a year ago that I did that for a month or something and got bored and moved on, there's like everything sits in a bucket. There was like a filter on the top of the bucket. I poured that all that information and in, swam around in that perspective. And then when I move away and like let that sit for a while, all the like false things or things that like aren't really valuable to me kind of like sink to the bottom and what's ever left on top is still true to me. It still feels really like palatable and like worthy of kind of integrating into my perspective. And when I go down a rabbit hole, you know, maybe a year later, sometimes it's a week later and I take on a whole different perspective. Like one could be like the simulation idea. You know, I'll be obsessed with that. And then the next idea will be a galactic alien thing and it's like we're seeded races from millions of years ago and there's the anunnaki and all this other wonderful like cool perspectives and which a lot of that can kind of contradict the simulation perspective so like they're they're contrasting things but some of the things from the simulation that were like true to me then align with the other galactic idea and all of a sudden there is this like over time, the years, there's been like a, a spider web type thing. It's like a bunch of little like 
lights of knowledge that then have these threads that connect. And so every now and then when I'm down a new rabbit hole, the bliss feeling that comes from it is like, oh my God, this is such a cool new idea and I've never looked at it this way. And then there's another level of bliss because I'm like, holy shit, this connects to the old truth of Christianity that I, when I was like 12, there's some truth in that. And it's it's not all what it, we thought it was. There's a metaphor here that applies to the galactic Anunnaki or like whatever. And that's what I think is over time is really valuable for me is that there is a thread of truth through all of it. But there's a lot of other distorted, like weird perspectives that people are trying to take on and transfer the truth. So it becomes like someone else's perspective of them looking at that knowledge. And so that's what I think is really fun. And it, it is like not for everybody, but um, oftentimes those things that do fall to the bottom that aren't true at that moment do light up a, a year later when I'm down some other rabbit hole and I've forgotten about it. But then this new information pings it out and I'm like, oh shit, there was that thing before that I thought wasn't true. Now it actually feels like it actually does fit in. The plug fits in here. So it's like in my head, there's a spider web kind of forming that is this fractal thing of lights and like lines that do kind of, for me, bring to this like wider awareness of truth. And that never ends to me. It's just this gigantic spider web. And I do think at some point I'll maybe get bored with just kind of like deep diving. But um, I think the important part that I'm having to learn is that there's not just searching for knowledge and like getting macro and macro. You do have to apply a lot of this stuff uh, to your life, you know, because some of it is more of the self-help, like spiritual rabbit holes are about, you know, vulnerability in your heart space and emotions and things that you can like, mentally understand but that's like half half the cake you have to kind of really apply them and have experience with it and sit with it in time and like learn how to actually meditate or learn how to have a good diet or not be addicted to drugs and not like bypass with drugs or whatever there's so many different things you actually have to apply and so i, I oftentimes will just spend too much time in the clouds um I would say a lot less. Yeah, I would say way less in the last. Yeah. And because I I think I've started to figure out that that's like I'm, I was only doing half the work, you know, and you can't just understand everything in your mind. You kind of will just like get left behind doing that. You have to really like apply the things and live those truths and, and try to figure out those metaphors through your actual experience in life. You actually have to like take a step in the reality and move through the fucking reality to have life happen to you and then learn how to respond in the correct ways or see people um, in the right ways. And so there's like en endless ways to look at it, you know, and I think that's what's so exciting now, too, is that the idea of like knowing that you don't know is that there's so many different ways to look at life and why we're here or consciousness. And that's kind of the trick you know like something i always think about is like it's so odd to try to study consciousness with a consciousness <coughs> yeah right like you can't it's like it's such a paradox i think why it's so hard to talk about sometimes because you're trying to use the thing to study the thing and so you're oftentimes like in your own way or you are not able to see the full thing and i think that's what's like such a funny trick with it and it kind of start you can turn it into like however whatever way you want to see it is the way you're going to see it because you're using the consciousness to study the consciousness <coughs> you're having trouble that coughing, sounds huh? yeah i'm trying to not cough that sounds like high people stuff that you just said which yeah. is funny because i'm not high, high. i'm i actually been off the little weed plant for a while off the ganja for uh, it's definitely a different experience podcasting with you sans, uh, sans marijuana. <laughs> I mean, that's a huge part of my, uh, the part of this whole process was that I u used weed. I loved, I had such a good relationship with marijuana. It helped me get through a lot of the pain and a lot of the like struggle within the band. I was smoking a lot. It helped my music a lot too, but 
I did start to lean on it a lot. And like there was this bypassing thing that I was in denial that was happening for a long time. Um, but it really does start to become, as with everything, it's like balance. And so you can start to like lean on something too much. I mean, I was smoking like nine to five every day, not nine to five. It was like nine to 10. <laughs> um, and that definitely obviously becomes a problem after a while. It was such a helpful thing to get through the emotions and the turmoil. It gave me more space to to kind of deal with that. But yeah, it's one of those things where you don't really see how clearly you are. It's in your way until you really stop it for a while and then go, oh, shit. Like that was really holding me back in a lot of ways. Yeah. Not only my ability to communicate, but my ability to kind of like deal with my emotions on my own in my in the right the better way than kind of having the weed as a friend to help me deal with it you know like yeah yeah it's funny um knowing you as someone who who smoked that much weed and then now uh, you you identified as someone who was bad at communicating and i only i met you when you were smoking that much and I was like, yeah, you are a little rough at communicate. Like, I understood everything you were saying, but seeing you in other situations trying to communicate with other people, I'm like, whew, yeah. And I mean, you do the cute the cute things where you butcher every figure of speech, but I, I believe you that that's just who you were, but that's just, you were really high. <laughs> I mean, dude, I, like, I was, it's, it's unfortunate to say, but I was, I, I've been high for, like, the last four years. It's longer than that. Okay, longer than that. See, yeah, I'm so high I don't remember. But you know, I, like seven I, I do have a lot of memories, but there's a lot of like wild stuff that I, I don't remember actually until somebody reminds me. I'm like, holy shit, I don't I did not recall that at all. Um and it is what it is. Like I said, I don't regret it. It was so helpful. And I'm not also in the position that to say that I we argue about this a lot, but I that I won't ever smoke it again. I think there's just a healthy relationship you have to have with it. Primarily these things for me, it's like you have to have a ritual with it and you have to have a real intention of why you're using it. And that's how it started with me. But then it became a like crutch and I overrid that and be like, ah, oh, it's fine. I, I'm because I was highly productive with it, I always like to say, because I, I could do a lot of things that you normal like some people that would smoke wouldn't be able to do those things. Um, but it, it's, it's like, I think the only way I could ever step back into it is very intentional and not extended use. It's like with a ritual around it. And if I'm using it to kind of like probe deep into consciousness <coughs> or like an idea or, or something in the same way you would use how you should properly be using psychedelics. But I'm kind of in the moment right now where I'm having so much fun, not having a, any kind of stimulus. Um, because there is a lot more clarity that I think is like more long lasting is like something with the brain waves or something that is like, I'm aligning those things more securely without a helper. So it's like on my own, I'm trying to get to that same state of highness yeah. without the weed, which is, I think what you're supposed to be using these drugs for anyways, is kind of to see like, holy shit, you can get there, but you can actually get there on the natch. Like you really can, uh, I only know that through like one or two experiences having gotten to like a heightened psychedelic space without um, drugs, but that's like hard to do all the time. I mean, but I've heard many people can do that and there's a lot of different, you know, I would say more organic or healthy ways to do it, like breathing and meditating, but not to sound like a fun, some fucking hippie tree hugger, but. Well, I think I love that description of, of weed and I, don't we don't fight about it all the time but we i don't yeah. mean, i mean we've thought about it like recently because i was trying to go back to it with a min million different dumb excuses that you knew were excuses <laughs> and i was trying to like trick myself <laughs> into like just let me <laughs> yeah but i would even say just since then i feel like so many things have clicked it is just it is it has been wild to watch this how much you like you would frame it before as weed helps me do things and then learning about your body and how much more rest you need than you think you need. I was like, oh, weed was helping you do things you didn't want to do. 
And when you frame it that you were high 24-7 in the band when you didn't want to be there anymore and in relationships you didn't want to be anywhere, like the, all all of this life you didn't want to be is like, oh, weed helped you run away into some attic in your mind. Yeah. And, and then, and, you know, conversely, it helped you do a lot of projects around the house. Like when you were high, I'm like, can we build this thing? And you would build it. And then now I'm like, oh, I have to wait until he actually wants to do it. This yeah. is a bummer. But... It's it's like meeting who you really are. And the thing that's just really interesting to me is you're actually super articulate and great at communicating. And it's just funny to me because I did notice when we would do podcasts and you would smoke a bunch of weed first. It's just like I'm a very sober person, but I'm like – it's just so funny people who smoke weed that they want to add weed to certain things. Like as a comedian – the worst fucking shows to do are weed shows because people who are who are higher laughing on the inside they don't realize that they're not laughing outside so it fucking <laughs> sucks to do stand up for them uh, that's funny and i feel like smoking weed would help you access these ideas back then where now i feel like you can just reach out and grab them but they would not help you communicate no. those ideas at all and so it is just yeah it's just been really fun to to get to know that i mean it, you've quit before but like i'm enjoying this but the how i started this rant was the description of weed as it's the high vibration low vibration shit which we both hate but weed is at like the super this one frequency let's say and when you're first going through this process, it helps you access a higher frequency or a different frequency, whatever. We don't believe in hierarchy, but it's hard to talk about this stuff without, you know, a different color frequency. And once you kind of naturally that becomes your baseline, then the weed becomes a detriment. The weed's holding you back. Yeah. You know? And I love that idea of like, you know, weed on occasion is intentional, whatever. But also you can just do whatever you want because you're a, a fucking grown ass man. But OK, so the last question I have, this has been great. This is like became a weed podcast. All of a sudden. <laughs> no, I think it's a it's a great it comes up a lot um, in conversations with people. So I think it's a vibe right now. Um, Something that we talk about that I think would be interesting to touch on is what is success what is success in your personal life and when you have achieved which i i can't relate to this but when you have achieved success by the world standards and that could be a lot like when you look the way people want you to look when you're when you're rich when you're famous when you're whatever when you have achieved material success according to people's projected thing, right? But everybody thinks, oh, if I had money, I'd be happy. Oh, if I had this, I'd be happy. And then you get there and it's like, oh, there's actually problems with this, whatever. But when you have had projected success and it's not what you wanted and then you leave that, and you go into what you've been in sort of an incubation healing period, right? And then I don't – I would say you've probably been living a life, building a life in the last year. What is success to you now? Are you no pressure as your partner? <laughs> 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 but honest answer, are you happy? Did you find it? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's kind of what my instinct answer was. I think success is happiness. Mm -hmm. And that, because I know the success that I had in the band didn't make me happy. And that's what was so troubling. And that, to go back to the beginning, that's probably what started my internal seeking, like advocately seeking or obsessively seeking something else was that we had just like the first two years we had played the SNL we had played all the TV shows we got Grammy nominations and then like it all finally like calmed down I went to Costa Rica by myself over my birthday and New Year's 
to like, because I just knew I needed to go by myself somewhere where nobody knew who I was so I could figure it out. And that, that what I kind of came to, I was like, dude, that, that's, that shit was cool. But like, I'm, it doesn't, it didn't like fill the void, which is what culture kind of told us. It's like what I, I understood. It was like, oh, when I get all these things, I'm gonna be at the Grammys. I'm gonna be at the top that I was like, shit, that like, it, it actually, it was really cool, but it didn't, it was some like really deep hole. So, um, I think success is like this being okay and being like happy with what is. Contentment. Contentment is like one of the biggest successes I think that anybody can have in life because like you don't see a lot of that really which is not to say that nobody's successful, but I think a lot of what we project as success with the celebrityism or like a lot of money or anything, there's not a lot of those people that feel like super content and like the ability to just like be still for a while, like with yourself is super hard for a lot of those people. I, it seems to be. And I know a lot of the people that I was around for a little bit in the like fame paradigm it wasn't a lot of people that were like genuinely like you could feel that they were like comfortable with themselves and just being still like they're always looking to get a substance, get a new experience, get some adrenaline, get some like never ending. Um, And so, yeah, I think I'm, I'm super happy. A lot of the times I also though, like feel like I'm still having to like dip into discontentment to kind of like heal out and weed out some of the like false programming that we pick up in life. Um, I'm more happy than I've ever been for sure. And I think maybe part of the like discontentment is that I don't have many witnesses to it probably. Yeah. Like I have you and my family and like a couple close friends but for the most part, like what it was before my life was like very public and very, there were like a lot of acquaintances and friends that were seeing me and kind of like grounding that reality in as much as I didn't like some of that. And now I live a very different life where it's like I'm in a little, it's kind of in the chrysalis thing where I'm like, I've healed a lot of things, have a deeper and broader awareness of myself and like what. I'm here to do and that like I'm just beginning to embark on like that new chapter and the discontentment is just like kind of uh, itching to kind of like get that going but there's been a like need to sit and heal and find the people that I'm supposed to have around me that kind of help me do that which is also like understanding the other side of myself which we're into a lot as human design and understanding I'm a projector and that there's like a lot of really weird quirky things about the projector that I used to think of myself as like they were faults or like things that I shouldn't be doing. And now letting myself do those things has brought a lot more ease in like the way I move through the world. And I'm just like learning how to do that really naturally. And so, yeah, I would say I'm very happy. Um, and feel like I actually have more success in doing what I'm doing now yeah. than than being in that lofted position in in a cultural success, you know. What are things that bring you joy now? Um, it's like so annoying. It's just like such simple things. No, I know. I think that's important. Yeah. Um. Yeah, like getting up in the morning and having coffee and reading a book or, or like listening to a podcast and having like alone time is like super important to me. And so that is like this safe place that like really makes me happy. You picking your nose right now. <laughs> I was scratching really the inside of my nose. <laughs> makes me joyful. Cracks and crevices, baby. Because I love being so comfortable with someone that they can pick their nose <laughs> in front of them. But scratching other. it. No, um... Yeah, I think the comfort of being with somebody like you is super important to me. Like I haven't had many people for a long time. I had kind of the, the wrong people around me. And I don't want to say that to like offend anybody that I don't talk to now because it's not, 
it was more about me. Like I'm saying with this projector thing, it's just like it's a very unique kind of thing for at least it's not unique, like special. It's just, it's like fucking weird. I don't know. I just have to have the right people around me and it was nobody else's fault. I just was around the wrong people. And so that was really hard for me to connect and relate to another person. And so like you're weird as hell and you need weird as hell people around you or people that like weird as hell. Yeah, and can be okay with that and can kind of see the some qual- good qualities in that or whatever. Because, like, I think there is a need to be seen, and I wasn't being seen by a lot of those people. And that's not their fault. That's just me needing to, like, set a boundary and go somewhere else, you know. And so I think, yeah, finding you and, and feeling that for the first time in a deep way and then being able to have discourse and, like, exchange all kinds of things with each other has been, like, a huge um avenue to like some deeper happiness that i hadn't experienced in a long time this now looks like i was fishing for a compliment about no myself. and i knew you weren't but i, just... I had to say it because i like <laughs> if i didn't say it it wasn't I, that's real that's real um <laughs> but uh and then it's other like s- tiny things man that are like so dumb but like cause they're not dumb it's just like it feels cheesy to say but um I think it's important. I think it's important that people know that you you get great joy from mowing the lawn. Yeah. Because that's something that people could do tomorrow. And it's you have had the detriment or the benefit. I think the very first podcast we ever did together, I said that you have had the experience that is the scariest and that is to get to the top and realize that happiness isn't there. And so you've had that benefit that you've gone up there and you go, oh, no, it's in the present moment. It's in mowing this lawn while listening to a podcast. It's in picking berries with my daughter. You know, sorry, I already know what what makes you fucking happy. I'll just say (laughs) it. Um, Because people do have access to that and not, you know, I the day I found contentment and I'm a very content person. Pretty much. I don't I get like frustrated or whatever, but I'm a. Is this true about me? I believe this about myself. Is this true that I'm a a pretty content? Yeah, person? I think you are very content, but you're discontent in the same way that a like that I am sometimes like an artist is. Yeah. When they 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 know they're here to like create something and so like when you're stagnant, which is necessary sometimes for like proper alignment of timing or like healing and like listening to your body that in those <laughs> moments you can feel discontent but well, like no in general your like soul is very content yeah i mean i yeah i'm i like change i crave change and transformation and so there is a cycle that i'm in but i guess when i when i think of discontent i think of the postponement of happiness happiness is almost too weighted that's why i like contentment yeah where there is an acceptance for me of i'm not going to feel good all the time and that life comes with pain you know you and i in the time that we've been together have have suffered greatly (laughs) through some rough shit and i have a contentment in that and the day i found contentment i was homeless i it was late it was like 11 30 or or 12 o'clock in the middle of the night, I didn't have enough money to put in a payphone to call somebody to ask them if I could stay with them, nor did I know of anyone who would let me do that. I was I was a smoker at the time. I didn't have any cigarettes. I didn't have a bottle of water. And I was just sitting at a bus stop. And I was like trying to figure out how I was going to like fall asleep on this thing with this um what do they call that? Like cruel architecture to stop homeless people from sleeping on it. Oh uh, yeah. And um, I just had this moment of clarity where situationally things could not have been much worse. You know, Um, my family, I couldn't go to my family. They thought I was dead. And I was like, I'm still happy. I'm fine. I don't. I mean, I was living out of a backpack at the time. I don't even know if I had the backpack with me. I had nothing. There's something nice about having nothing to lose. Yeah. But I have nothing. And I am okay. 
And that's it was part of a years long realization that happiness is not circumstantial. And that's really easy to say from this position that I'm in now when my circumstances are pretty great. But that's not when I learned it. I learned it at bottom, like pretty close to rock bottom. And throughout my time in, you know, in intermittent homelessness and and drug addiction, I would check in with myself and go, am I okay? And I would go, yeah, I'm okay. These are my circumstances, but my circumstances somehow don't have anything to do with the state of being. And man, that's a powerful fucking lesson that I've had to learn a hundred times over. Because then when you get things, they come with the complications and attachments. It's almost harder to have things. And the full circle of whatever we're calling awakening is that all I have is this moment. And stepping on grass, as fucking stupid and hippie as that sounds, is holds all of the potential of walking into the Grammys. Actually, for me, way better potential because something like the Grammys has so much people pretending to be in social anxiety and everything else that what I feel like we have we have contemplated together a lot over the last year is how much of what we're all seeking is what other people have told us is success and what is success actually is success the the longest stretches of sustained contentment if so i've experienced that you know yeah. i am experiencing that i think we are experiencing that and i also you know there are, there are, i've enjoyed success as well you know i don't think i would have enjoyed your success um, success for me involves a lot of being myself and being seen for being myself. That is so paramount to me and has been for a really long time. And in the last couple of years and, and watching kind of what you went through, I was like, wow, I've done a really good job of cultivating connections with people only that truly see me, you know, because it's it's very painful and, and it's not somebody else's fault. It comes down to why am I trying to be seen by someone who I'm not their cup of tea. Yeah. Why am I trying to have connections with people who don't like the way that I move through the world? What is that about me that I'm trying to seek that? I guess I have had that experience a couple times in the last few years. My neck hurts from like staring at yeah, you. Yeah, I can tell. You um, can turn the mic this way if you want. I think we did it. Yeah, I think this is beautiful. And I, was, I love you sharing that. So that was really cool. Um. All right. Well, uh, want to meet back here in January of 2024? <laughs> yeah, I want to try to start doing this more, but I, I don't I can't promise anything. Yeah, we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I think that before you wanted to share ideas and it felt like, well, I have to establish this is how I am with podcasts, too. Like I have to establish my perspective first. So yeah. You know about and. The paint just was not dry. No, totally. It's like <laughs> going through it. And I think that's, yeah, if it kind of, you're right. If it does feel like a little bit of a bookend, I think it doesn't, it's still some things to go through, but it, it's, uh, yeah, it feels way clearer um, to to potentially be like sharing a bit more than to be like in the fire trying to go, yeah, this is awesome, man. Awakening is so cool. <laughs> and let's not call it awakening. Let's call it something else. So it's like, I, I just hate the fucking, the, the, everybody feels like some authority in that that kind of when you start saying like awake and not awake and it, it's just like excludes people and things it's just not what it is but i think we've gotten to the point where we don't even need to address that yeah i guess so too it's like that's what i'm saying like just speaking about awareness because like the thing it's just like i being a seeker sometimes comes with like oh you just like want to be in a book all the time like experience is the thing so go out to the bar go do your thing go it's like I don't. It's like, not who I am. Yeah, it's not who I am, and I, 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 like, I do really find a lot of joy in reading books and and seeking more, not because I'm trying to like get better than somebody or find the ultimate meaning to life. Like as I said, I don't think there really is, but there's like there's more to know, and like why wouldn't you want to see broader in like why we're here? Like that that's endless, and there's so much 
amazing growth that can happen from from doing that so it's um something that i do enjoy sharing like new ideas like that and so we'll get to that point i guess but it, you're right it did have to establish a foundation of of connecting the my previous life to kind of this new thing the chrysalis kind of coming through yeah giving people the opportunity to hop off if they don't like it yeah everything's not for everyone yeah um all right well we'll where see can they find you jessa <laughs> The thing you say at the end of every podcast, everybody's supposed to say. Oh, God. Tell us a little about yourself. Where can we find you? Um, Just read comedy on Instagram. That's where people can find you. I'm responsible for (laughs) posting all the pictures of your life. Oh, right. Yeah, I don't post anything. I post my daughter sometimes. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I have podcasts. Who cares? They either are listening to this because they know who I am or they are wholly disinterested in me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not going to end this podcast with any kind of, here's where you can find you. You can find us in the fucking You found me. Ether. I'm here. I'm right here in this moment with you. Okay. Thank you for asking me questions again. Bye. Thank you.